<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenue, mesdames, messieurs. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the inauguration of the Nelson Mandela Lectureship in Human Rights, named in remembrance of and in tribute to a hero of humanity, Nelson Mandela, Canada's second honorary citizen, our first actually Our first actually happens to be Raoul Wallenberg, who was himself deeply admired by Nelson Mandela, who endured 27 years in a South African prison, and who emerged to not only preside over the dismantling of apartheid, but to become the president of the first ever free, democratic, and non-racial South Africa. It is only fitting that our inaugural lecture be delivered by Justice Dingdang Masaneki, himself an icon of the anti-apartheid movement, who was a young political prisoner together with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, who was himself beaten and tortured in detention, and who emerged to become the deputy Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, having also been one of the architects of its constitution and the Deputy Justice of the Republic of South Africa. And I'm delighted to welcome him here together with his wife, Kobonina, who's herself a hero of the anti-apartheid movement, and welcome to you both this evening. Justice Masaneki will be introduced in a few moments by our Chief Justice of Canada, Chief Justice Richard Wagner, who hosted Justice Masaneki with a group of judges from the Supreme Court on Friday in Ottawa. And I want to thank you, Justice Wagner, for taking time from your duties and responsibilities in Ottawa to come especially to Toronto to introduce Justice Masaneki this evening. Get another example of your leadership as Chief Justice. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Randall Hansen, who's the interim director of the Monk Center for Global Affairs and Public Policy, himself a distinguished uh, professor at the University of Toronto and noted uh, scholar, and I'm sure many of you have read his seminal works. Randall. Thank you, Erwin, for that moving uh, introduction. Mr. Kotler, Dr. Young, Mr. Ray, Ms. de Croisier, Justice Wagner, Justice Mosenega, members of parliament, deans, senators, and distinguished guests, welcome. We at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy are delighted to host Justice Dick Gang Mozeneka for the inaugural Nelson Mandela Human Rights Lectureship. There is, quite simply, no better person to give this lecture and, though modesty should really forbid, no better place to give it. Through education, collaborative research, and robust public dialogue, the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy has become this country's leading hub for research, teaching, and public engagement. And human rights is basic to what we do. Research in our citizen lab, our global justice lab, and our global migration lab is animated by an enduring concern for human rights. Throughout that work, we recognize both this country's failure and its privilege. In the former, we are part of a painful but essential conversation, and I note in that regard Bob Ray's work in particular, about this country's basic history as a racial state, a history of dispossession, expulsion, and the subjugation of First Nations peoples. In the latter, we recognize that we are very lucky. 
We live in a country in which we can lobby against human rights abuses, both historical and contemporary, without fear of intimidation, arrest, or imprisonment. In that regard, the respect of the Monk School and of me personally for Justice, Justice Mozaneka is intellectual, it is personal, and it is without limit. Thank you all for joining us. I'm very much looking forward to the remarks tonight. And now let me hand the floor over to Dr. Young, President and CEO of the Human Rights Museum. Thank you, Randall, and uh, really it's an honor to be here with you this evening. Um, we are pleased to partner with the Raoul Wallenberg Center and the Monk Center for Global Affairs and Public Policy for this evening's event. For those of you who don't know much about the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, we are located on Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg. We opened our doors in 2014. And as a national museum, our mandate is to explore the subject of human rights with special but not exclusive reference to Canada in order to enhance the public's understanding of human rights, to promote respect for others, and to encourage reflection and dialogue. And for the past six months, it's been our pleasure to feature one of the most courageous human rights defenders of our time, Nelson Mandela in our special exhibition, Mandela, Struggle for Freedom. Throughout the exhibition, visitors are immersed in apartheid-era South Africa and hear some of the many stories of those who were steadfast in the pursuit of a more just society. Some of you may have noticed on your way in that we've brought a few elements from that exhibition with us today, a video which demonstrates how inspired people continue to be by Mandela's struggle, and an interactive digital display that lets visitors create and publish their own apartheid protest poster with images, themes, and phrases drawn from those that would have been made uh, used in the making of posters in South Africa and around the world during apartheid. Making one of these posters is an experience that visitors to Mandela struggle for freedom have taken advantage of many thousands of times. Their posters are published in gallery, within the exhibition, and online for the world to see. So before you leave here today, if you have the opportunity, if you haven't yet availed yourself of this opportunity, I encourage you to experience this uh, in the room next door. In the six months since the exhibition opened, we've witnessed an outpouring of emotion from so many of our visitors. As people exit, we have a place where they can share their thoughts about Mandela and the struggle against apartheid. And we've already received many thousands of notes shared by visitors from across Canada and around the world. I brought the content of one note with me and I just thought I would share it with you because it resonates particularly strongly. Quote, we can pay too much attention to what someone looks like or sounds like. We can forget that we are all people. So I will try to be kind loving and respectful to everyone. I will stand up for people's rights and I will try to understand other people's situation and have empathy. Empathy is one of those core responsibilities uh, for our institution. We hope to charge people with an understanding and empathy for people they have not yet met, stories they did not know, and the overall struggle that is part of the Canadian journey towards a better world. We want people to build personal connections with human rights because that personal connection can be more powerful than a carefully worded resolution or the most precise statement of fact. When people can see elements of themselves and their own story in the stories of human rights defenders like Mandela, we are much closer to helping them understand not just the facts of apartheid, but the motivation to risk everything to create a better world. And we are that much closer to helping people look around in their own community for opportunities to be of service to others and to the greater goal of advancing and defending human rights. That's why it's essential that we continue to deepen our understanding of Mandela. His life and legacy illuminate what can be a dark and winding path 
as we work towards greater respect for human rights for everyone. This exhibition is also an opportunity for Canadians to remember the role that Canadians played in the anti-apartheid movement. It was a cause that brought tens of thousands of Canadians together in church basements or on university campuses, in boardrooms and on shop floors, bridging their differences in the search of a just peace in South Africa. In an era when our global community is increasingly aware that our freedoms are fragile, our liberties precarious, and our progress towards greater human rights for all uneven, the story of Canadians who reached across the world to take the hands of others in partnership is an inspiration, and it is one that we want Canadians to discover. Today we are very fortunate to have another defender of human rights among us, Justice Mosineke. Justice, your journey from a jail cell on Robben Island alongside Mandela to Deputy Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court in post-apartheid South Africa and your steadfastness commit, steadfast commitment to democracy and the rule of law resonates around the world. It's a great honor to be here with you this evening. Thank you for inviting the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to be with you. And I encourage you all to visit us soon. Thank you, Miglich. John, I want to commend you for your inspired leadership at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. I've had the occasion and the privilege of being there at its opening and, and visiting uh, the museum, and this is really an ongoing educational public service uh, for all Canadians. And when you spoke of the impact of uh, Nelson Mandela on Canadians, on our common humanity, I, I couldn't help but think of my daughter, Gila, who's uh, sitting here, she'll be embarrassed by my saying it, but she grew up, if you will, as a child of the anti-apartheid movement. We used to take her to demonstrations my, myself when she was a little child before she could even speak, and uh, this became part of her being and part of her commitment to human rights, and she's here with a group of students from Guelph this evening, so thank you for being with us, uh, Gila, and to my wife for her engagement all these years in this cause. And while expressing appreciation, I want to, to the staff of the Monk Center and to our own Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I'm sorry I can't name each of you individually, but collectively and well as individually, very much appreciate your contribution uh, to this evening. Now my pleasure to call Professor Natalie Desrosiers, former Dean of Law at the University of Ottawa, of which Justice Wagner is perhaps his most distinguished uh, graduate, uh, a former chair of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, now a member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, uh, to ask her to say a few words and to introduce our Chief Justice, Justice Wagner. Distinguished guests, it's a real honor for me to be here uh, at this in inaugural Nelson Mandela Lecture on Human Rights. First, I want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous territory for uh, generations and millennium, and I think it is particularly important to recognize this uh, tonight. It was a gathering place for indigenous people, and it's so perfect to be here gathered to discuss in, uh, human rights. There's no better moment in uh, our times to be discussing human rights. I think we need to renew our commitment, our intellectual commitment, our emotional commitment, our legal commitment, and our political commitment to human rights. So I'm particularly delighted to see uh, the partners and the partnership that is represented here. You have the Monk School representing the intellectual commitment that we deserve to human rights. The, 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 the Musée Canadien uh, des Droits de la Personne, the Canadian Museum, that will express our emotional attachment, uh, hopefully, to, uh, to human rights. The Raoul Wallenberg uh, that is out there advocating all the time in the great leadership that Erwin Kotler has brought to it, and also the legal minds that are behind this. So, I want to say what a great partnership and what a great way to celebrate this new, uh, this new partnership by having the first inaugural lecture. 
I'm here to introduce uh, uh, the Right Honorable uh, Richard Wagner, who is a uh, graduate of the University of Ottawa. He was both a holder of a civil law degree and also of a political science degree. He uh, had a great distinguished career in the bar in Quebec uh, until he was appointed in 2004 at the Cour Supérieure du Québec, the Superior Court. Graduated to the Court of Appeal in 2011. Right away, they saw his potential and moved into the Supreme Court in 2012, and he became our Chief Justice in 2017. I had the privilege of uh, knowing uh, Justice uh, Wagner even before he was so famous, so I can say that he is a man of incredible curiosity, commitment to the rule of law, he is open-minded, and has really brought the, the Supreme Court to a modern age. We are well served by our, our Supreme Court Chief Justice. Merci, Monsieur le Juge. Thank you so much, uh, Nathalie, for those uh, very generous words. Too generous, I would say. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an immense privilege to be here today to inaugurate the Nelson Mandela Lectureship in Human Rights. And it is my tremendous honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Justice Masaneke. South Africa and Canada have a strong and enduring relationship, especially through our courts. Our legal systems are founded on both common and civil law traditions, giving us both unique approaches. The Constitutional Court, where Justice Masaneke last sat on the bench, seeks out jurisprudence and even law clerks from around the world. And as a Canadian, I am proud that they have found inspiration from our jurisprudence on many issues. For our part, we at the Supreme Court of Canada regularly cite South African case law. These fruitful connections have helped build a strong common link between our two nations. I can think of no better person to deliver this afternoon's inaugural address. Justice Masaneke was born in Pretoria, South Africa, under apartheid. Confronted with oppression, injustice, and violence from a young age, he did what he knew was right. He resisted. He joined groups that were dedicated to fighting apartheid, and the cruelty it wrought. Groups that wrote pamphlets and got them in the hands of others to spread the message. Groups that organized, that gave an oppressed people hope. But early one morning in 1963, when Justice Masaneke was 15, police burst into his home. They handcuffed him. They told his terrified mother he was being arrested for terrorism. He was eventually tried for sabotage and treason. His true crime is being resistance to the racist and immoral apartheid regime. For this, Justice Masaneke spent 10 long years in prison on Robben Island off, off the shores of Cape Town. He made use of his time there finishing secondary school and completing two bachelor's degrees. He later completed an LLB and began working as an attorney's clerk in 1976, eventually becoming an advocate, what we would call a barrister in our system. Eventually, and after immense struggle, apartheid was ended. The political prisoners who remained on Robben Island and in prisons elsewhere were released. In 1993, Justice Masaneke, by then a respected advocate and senior counsel, was chosen to serve on the technical committee 
that drafted South Africa's interim constitution, helping transition it to democracy. In 1994, he became the deputy chairperson of the Independent Electoral Commission, which conducted the first democratic elections in South Africa's history. This, of course, was the election in which his close friend from those years on Robben Island, Mr. Nelson Mandela, the namesake of this lectureship, became their nation's first democratically elected president. And Justice Mosaniki went on to do so much more. He was appointed to, to, to the High Court in Pretoria in 2001, to the Constitutional Court in 2002, and became Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa in 2005. How remarkable. How remarkable to see your society change so completely after working for decades to make that happen. How remarkable 30 years after, after being imprisoned for fighting injustice to become an architect of a new society and dismantle the invidious system that put you there in the first place. How remarkable to see your friend and fellow inmate lead your nation to democracy, justice, and the rule of law. How remarkable to go from an oppressed class to a prisoner to attorney, advocate, and one of your country's top judges in a single lifetime. How remarkable to leave a legacy of justice and dignity for your children and grandchildren. I wish that Justice Moss and the Key were the only person who had a story like this to tell, who felt the sting of injustice for standing up for what he believed in, for what was right. I wish that such stories belong only in the past, but we only need to pick up a newspaper, or should I say, go to, to the website, to, reminded, to be reminded that it is not so. That's why Justice Mosinicki's message to us today, why his very presence here is so important. The lessons he can teach us are not just about the past. They are just as urgent right now. I am proud that South Africans like Justice Mosinicki could count on Canada to do the right thing decades ago to stand up for justice. That imperative still compels us, our country, our courts, our institutions today. Time only moves forward. Let us all do what we can to ensure that the struggle for human rights does too. And with that, I give you our distinguished speaker, Justice Masanaki. Well, should I cry? Maybe I should. I am deeply grateful, Chief Justice Wagner. I don't know if I deserve any of the things you said. I'm grateful. I've prepared a text, like a good jurist, someone to work through the text. And I hope that you're going to be still wide-eyed by the time I finish. <laughs> I have something to tell. I thought it's appropriate to structure it and convey it as best as I can. Um, to, I back with you that indulgence to allow me to do that. But again, I am deeply, deeply grateful and I'll be saying more of this as I get down to the text and get 
the job done. I hope in 20, maybe in 30 minutes, but I'd like to say this, and I trust that it will keep you awake still. I owe my presence here to the Honorable Professor Owen Kotler, a truly distinguished Canadian jurist and a human rights activist of world renown. During his visit to our country, South Africa, he paid me a courtesy visit in my chambers at the Constitutional Court, the apex court in all matters in our country, where I was serving as an Associate Chief Justice of the Republic. Whatever transpired at that meeting led to a kind but resilient invitation to travel to Canada to deliver the inaugural Mandela Lectureship in Human Rights. I rightly extend my gratitude to the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. There is our co-host, and in particular its chair, again the Honorable Professor Kotler, and Executive Director, Ms. Judith Abiton, who I happily met today, and her staff who did so much to make my wife, Kabunina, and I comfortable. To my gratitude, I must add the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, as well as the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Toronto. I'm grateful for the attendance of the Right Honorable, the Chief Justice of Canada, <coughs> Richard Wagner, and other honorable judicial colleagues, members of parliament, and as well as <coughs> distinguished members of the academy. In advance, I'd like to thank the honorable Robert Reeve for his remarks later. I equally thank all here present as we induct the lectureship in the human rights, named after one of the finest and the most revered leaders of our time, <coughs> Nelson Holisasa Mandela. I'm thankful for the singular honor to inaugurate this lectureship. As I do so, I hope to ponder over Nelson Mandela's tireless devotion to the advancement of fundamental rights and freedoms. I am in deep awe of his relentless combat against colonialism and apartheid. I remain amazed at how Nelson Mandela survived 27 years of unremitting imprisonment, 18 years of which was in solitary confinement on Robben Island. Many watchers of Nelson Mandela would choose to glorify his sheer tenacity to fight a good fight. Some might single out his near impeccable leadership of the African National Congress and of oppressed people in a long struggle for liberation. Others might venerate him for his selfless desire to, to free and serve others. And yet some might be in awe of his choice to favor forgiveness over revenge. Yet other watchers of Nelson Mandela might be struck by his perennial humility, his assertion that all praise is due not to him, but to the collective of good people of all ilk who sought to defeat apartheid both at home and across the world, including Canadians. But what fascinates me to no end is the prophetic leadership Nelson Mandela assumed when victory against apartheid was in full sight and transition was certain. But having been a jurist for over 40 years now, I've chosen to celebrate a particular niche in the many glittering features of the life of Nelson Mandela. The space he afforded the growth of a robust and liberating jurisprudence infused by all the goodness of our humanity. 
To that end, I've chosen to examine three subsets. First, how Nelson Mandela engineered the transition from apartheid to a constitutional democracy. Second, I'll peer at Nelson Mandela's notions of transitional justice. And third, the way he fostered constitutionalism that favored robust jurisprudence and human rights during his presidential watch and later. Lastly, I pose the difficult question, whether the romanticized world of indivisible, interrelated and self-evident truths crystallized into domestic and global fundamental rights and freedoms have lost patches in a post-truth world marked by insular nationalism, ethical relativism, and a retreat from multilateralism and international human rights norms. But who is he? At the outset of inaugural lecture, we must surely ask, who is Nelson Mandela? <coughs> Excuse me. In his seminal biography, Long Walk to Freedom, he relates his first day in class as a tiny rural boy. What is your name, young man? The English lady teacher asked. I am Kholisasa Mandela, ma'am. What? Who? What did you say? No, no. You are Nelson. She fired back. Neither the English lady teacher nor the newly anointed Nelson knew what all that would mean to him and to the world. Nelson Mandela embraced this colonial imposition of a name from his childhood and carried it up to the lofty heights of global renown and deep reverence. Most in the world who can see or hear know who Nelson Mandela is, <coughs> excuse me, what he stood for and what long walk to freedom he ventured to the end of his life. This year, Nelson Rolislasa Mandela would have been 100 years of age. We in South Africa and around the world have been celebrating his centenary year. He was born in 1918 on the 18th of July in a small Eastern Cape village of Mdeso. The anniversary of his date of birth is celebrated annually by the United Nations as Nelson Mandela International Day. He sprouted from the Madiba clan, a part of Abatembu people and Amakosa royalty, but his father died early in his childhood. He was the first in his family to attend school enrolling at the Methodist Primary School in Kono. After high school, Mandela was admitted to the University College of Fort Hay, then reserved for indigenous Africans. There he studied Bachelor of Arts. These became formative years in Mandela's political upbringing. He met fellow comrade and lifelong friend, Oliver Reginald Tumbo. Then many anti-colonial leaders of the time attended the same university, including Robert Mugabe, who became president of Zimbabwe, Seretse Khama, who became president of Botswana, Robert Sobukwe, the founder and leader of the Pan-Africanist Congress, and Mangosutu Kutelezi, founder and leader of Inkata Freedom Party, and, and later a minister in Nelson Mandela's first democratic cabinet. Mandela's role in student politics saw him expelled from the university in the final year of his BA studies 
only to complete his BA degree through another university. Soon after he wound up, soon after he wound up in Johannesburg, secured a position as an article clerk or an apprentice in a law firm. He then enrolled for the LLB degree at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, but became increasingly involved in politics. He joined the African National Congress, helped form its youth league, and later rose to become its national president. In 1948, the National Party took over power in South Africa and expanded segregation by introducing apartheid legislation and policies. The young, strident, militant, and angry Nelson Mandela vowed to combat apartheid oppression and exclusion. He became even more instrumental within the African National Congress and its leadership structures. And unsurprisingly, the apartheid regime chose to end his public activism. 1952, he was charged under the Suppression of Communism Act, found guilty and sentenced to nine months of hard labor, suspended for two years. Despite this, Mandela approached the High Court and sought admission to practice as an attorney or solicitor, as you would say, despite the conviction. Rams Bottom J penned a remarkably progressive judgment given the apartheid setting of the time. He admitted Nelson Mandela as an attorney, reasoning that Mandela's conviction did not point to ethical turpitude, but rather demonstrated his distaste for the political system he found himself in. Shortly thereafter, Mandela and Oliver Tambo set up the famous law firm in Johannesburg, Mandela and Tambo Attorneys. I rehearsed the detail of Mandela's fight to be admitted as an off officer of the court for two good reasons. First, at a selfish level, 25 years later, I relied on the president of Mandela versus Incorporated Law Society when I moved my application for admission as an attorney after my 10 years incarceration on Robben Island, as you had for political activism. Like Mandela, I pressed on the court that I was not, I was not only properly qualified, but also I was a fit and proper person to practice law because my imprisonment was a matter of political conscience and not of lack of ethical probity. Like Nelson Mandela, I was admitted to the sidebar and later to the bar, despite being an ex-con, in case you wondered. The second reason for narrating Nelson Mandela's admission as an attorney is that he was an odd mixture of a revolutionary, that is, a destroyer of the status quo, on the one hand, and a keeper of the law. In other words, he valued the normative rigor of the law and its potential to do good, and yet he was deeply intolerant of unjust laws, particularly of a variety that insulated the law from domestic revision as apartheid was. Nelson Mandela observed that the law was harnessed in the service of a crime against humanity, apartheid. In sum, he hated injustice deeply and gave his life to combat it. After he started practicing law, Mandela's life became a litany of banning orders, house arrests, incessant political trials, ending with life imprisonment. Around 1955, he was arrested, along with 155 other high-profile anti-apartheid activists, and indicted for high treason. The accused had to endure a treason trial that lasted for six years, only to be acquitted in 1961. Thanks to the high-end defense team led by Easy Mazel's QC, a close associate, who happens to be a close associate of the Honorable Kotler. But in 1960, the PAC initiated and led project marches against the past laws. In response, the police killed 69 unarmed people. 
This became known as the Shabdil Massacre. Following the tragic events, state of emergency was declared and the ANC and the PAC were both banned. This meant that Mandela's membership of the ANC and its peaceful protest strategies were rendered unlawful. I need not say that. That was not enough to restrain young, angry Nelson Mandela. It's revolutionary fervor. Mandela and his comrades felt justified to resort to the armed struggle as a legitimate form of resistance. And therefrom sprung up Umkonto, where Caesar launched on the 16th of December, 1961. And for his leadership of the MK, as early as 1961, Nelson Mandela was charged and sentenced to five years in prison. Whilst in prison, the police raided Lily's Lee Farm, a secret hideout of the ANC and the Communist Party activists in Rivonia, and arrested several other leaders. Although in prison, Mandela was implicated in the documents found in the raid, he was charged together with co accused the capital crime of sabotage in what became known as the infamous Rivonia trial. While facing the death penalty, instead of pleading for mercy from his trial court to save his life, Nelson Mandela burst into these memorable lines, which are now inscribed on the walls of our constitutional court. I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal for which I hope to live and to achieve, but it is an ideal for which, if needs be, I am prepared to die. He was condemned to life imprisonment, which meant his natural life in jail. He served 27 years, as you heard, 18 years of which in solitary confinement on Robben Island. As a tiny lad of 15 years of age, I met Nelson Mandela while serving my but 10 years imprisonment on Robben Island. He became a father figure and a mentor to me. That comradely and paternal bond was to persist and die to the course of my career at the sidebar, at the bar, later as a judge of the High Court and a justice of our highest court. At his express request, I appeared as counsel for his wife, Nomzamo Winifred Madikizela Mandela, on a collection of criminal charges, the so-called Stompy Trial. At his invitation, I served, as you heard, in the technical committee that drafted our interim constitution. He caused me to be appointed as co-leader of the body that ran our first democratic elections in 1994. I helped form and serve as chair of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, one of his first loves. For over 15 years, I acted as initial counsel in divorce proceedings with his wife, Winnie Mandela, and I must add, I was Winnie's counsel and not Nelson Mandela's counsel, <laughs> whilst he was the head of state. It is no exaggeration that Kabonina, my wife, and I were close family friends. He indeed did much to persuade me to accept the nomination to the high court bench. In his feebler years, he asked me to accept his nomination that I act as the executor in his deceased estate and trustee in his inter vivos family trust. Both roles I have dutifully fulfilled since he passed on. Finally, on the 11th of February 1990, Mandela's unconditionally released from prison Tough constitutional negotiations ensued. A new democratic constitution was crafted by consensus. Mandela majority of South Africans cast their votes, and Mandela became our first democratic president and rightly the father 
of our reborn nation. And true to his word, Nelson Mandela remained in office for a single term of five years. He donated his presidential salary to a few needy chosen causes. He retired from politics in 1999. He was indeed beyond the allurement of money, of political power, and of glory. After suffering from a prolonged respiratory infection, Nelson Holisata Mandela succumbed in his home in Houghton, Johannesburg, on the 5th of December, 2013. And we buried him as his will directed at his ancestral home in Kono. Ladies and gentlemen, we all owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. The transition, the finest hour of Nelson Mandela's long and complex life was during the transition from apartheid to democracy. It matters not how one characterizes the transition, because it's characterized variously in many papers at home and elsewhere in the world. In the end, significant domestic actors had firmly resolved to negotiate a new constitutional framework that would bring a screeching halt to centuries old strife. Two adenal features of the transition reassured many activists the first was the unilateral unbanning of all liberation movements and the release of political prisoners. Second, the primary demands of pro-democracy forces, unqualified franchise for all, and the constitutional entrenchment of a Bill of Rights. That was revolution, if you imagine what the provisions under apartheid were. And these were readily considered by the minority ruling clique up front. Third was the separation of the constitution-making process into two phases. The interim constitution would be agreed upon first by the political parties with untested, with first, but by political parties with untested democratic support. This meant that only a constituent assembly of elected representatives of the people would adopt the final constitution. So to speak, we the people, through our elected representative, would in that way usher in a new constitution. And to these considerations must be added the shared belief in the relevance of the law in the process of transition. Academic commentators attribute the confidence of the domestic negotiations to the usefulness of the law in the transition to a variety of factors. I think beyond the fact that Mr. Mandela and Mr. Lee Clark were trained lawyers, a factor often rightly raised, there were significant practical legacy considerations that impelled negotiators towards resorting to a formal legal process in order to give effect to the transition. And this makes our transition different from many around the world. First, the minority legislator so to speak, the purveyors of apartheid undertook to fall on their sword. A sitting parliament had to disestablish itself. It had to adopt an interim constitution that would lead to the demise of apartheid and usher in majority rule. Second, the uppermost practical concern was that the transition had to occur in an orderly fashion. It was thus imperative that it occurred on a going concern basis. Any significant disruption of governance and of daily administration would have threatened and discredited the transition to democracy. Properly so, the transitional provisions of the interim constitution preserved all laws which immediately before its commencement were in force, 
subject to any subsequent repeal or amendment by a competent authority. And it is Nelson Mandela who insisted all the time that even in a, a transition as drastic as this, there will be order and there will be the rule of law and that we, his lieutenant, ensured. Third, the interim constitution carried a number of vital protections from the ruling minority. Thus, the inaugural duty of the newly established constitutional court was to certify the final constitution for consistency with the constitutional principles enumerated in the interim constitution. In that way, the curtain fell and the horrific drama of apartheid came to a formal end. We who were born in and lived through our revolution were presented <coughs> excuse me, with a historic privilege to be the founding mothers and fathers of our supreme law. It was Nelson Mandela who steered us to that historic privilege of our lifetime. But then transitional justice issues inevitably arose. Notions of transitional justice gained currency, as we will all remember, after the Second World War in relation to the crimes of German and Japanese generals and soldiers. Nuremberg trials were directed mainly at criminal accountability. <clears throat> Excuse me, the prevailing stance of the victors was that war crimes had to be punished and reparation paid. In the 1970s and 80s, members of military juntas in Greece and Argentina were too brought to trial. And the positive byproduct of these trials was the rise of international human rights law and conventions. Also, the discourse migrated from merely indicting recalcitrant generals to being, I quote, self-consciously victim-centric, and thus inducting democratic practice inspired by international human rights. And the next innovation was the emergence of truth commissions, as we saw in Argentina, for instance, in 1983, in Chile, in 1990. And the next 10 was ours, <coughs> in 1995, under the leadership of Nelson Mandela. Thus, the conundrum of transitional justice that faced us in South Africa was complex, but not new. We had to ask the same questions. What should we do to our oppressors? To the recalcitrant army generals who committed atro atrocious crimes against civilians in defense of apartheid military state the generals who had bolstered apartheid would not support F.W.D. Clack and the transition to democracy without a promise of amnesty for their ample and heinous crimes against civilians during apartheid. And many pro-democracy activists, including me, I must add, and including Mandela's own party members initially opposed amnesty for politically inspired crimes by security forces, particularly as they sought it in a blanket form. They demanded full, activists demanded full reparation for civilian victims and criminal accountability. Mandela swam against the collective stream of historical pain and anger. He carefully argued that ours was not an outright military victory, but a post-conflict compromise. Our historic duty 
was to buy peace and stability in order to establish a flourishing democracy that will foster reconstruction and development. The price for peace and stability, Nelson Mandela argued, was national reconciliation and amnesty. The activists replied to Nelson Mandela that even if his amnesty argument had merit, it had to be contingent on divulging past pain and confessing historic wrongdoing. <clears throat> this resolution of this difficult debate, which Nelson Mandela won, found its way into the compromise found in the epilogue to the interim constitution. And it is crafted in poignant words. Read into it Nelson Mandela's voice, and I quote, the adoption of this constitution lays secure foundation for the people of South Africa to transcend the division and strive of the past. We generated gross violations of human rights, the transgression of humanitarian principles in violent conflict and a legacy of hatred, fear, guilt, and revenge. These can now be addressed on the basis that there is a need for understanding but not for vengeance. A need for reparation, but not retaliation. A need for Ubuntu, but not victimization. <coughs> Excuse me. In order to advance such reconciliation and reconstruction, amnesty shall be granted in respect of acts, omissions, and offenses associated with political objectives and committed in the course of conflict of the past. To this end, Parliament, under this Constitution, shall adopt a law providing for the mechanism through which such amnesty shall be dealt with any time after the law has been passed and the code ends there. Truth and reconciliation hearings were held under the applicable statute and presided over by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Much pain and many confessions of crime came to the fore. The jury's indeed still out on the usefulness of the process in our context. But on balance, of all remarkable things Mandela has accomplished in his long life of struggle, his contribution approach to transitional justice stands out. Had he got that wrong, the whole transition would collapse, would, would have collapsed entirely, and violence would have overtaken it. My last compliment, I'm nearing the end, but you are still all wide-eyed, so I feel <laughs> suitably flattered. My last compliment, our core to Mandela, is the space our constitutional architecture afforded the protection of human rights and resultant jurisprudence. We opted for restraining and controlling all public power and private power within overarching basic law. To that end, we have opted for a system which separates and divides public power, but polices its exercise rigorously. This does not mean the democratic ethos is subsumed by judicial oversight. The will of the people, once encrusted into law, binds all, including the judiciary. We have entrenched a full sum catalog of fundamental human rights and have enjoined the state to respect, protect, and promote and fulfill these protections. In our jurisdiction, all law or conduct that is inconsistent with the Constitution is invalid to the extent of its inconsistency. This means that all public power and in certain limited circumstances, private power is subject to constitutional control. The state must promote it, must advance it, and obey its constitutional obligations. And the judiciary is vested with plenary powers to review legislative and executive conduct. Put testly, the judiciary is enjoined to police compliance with the Constitution. And it is this remarkable constitutional architecture that has afforded a senior judiciary unprecedented powers of judicial review. <clears throat> 
and we had the space to start afresh from horrible jurisprudence of apartheid to craft a new jurisprudence. And that we did to our hearts content. It is in that inspired constitutional setting that our courts fashioned a remarkable jurisprudence from the ashes of a historical phoenix. As we created a new jurisprudence anew, we've looked unashamedly to other jurisdictions. And this our constitution permits. It requires us to consider foreign law by which we are not bound and yet we are obliged to consider. And yet we readily embrace and learn from comparative jurisprudence. We are obliged to give effect to customary international law unless it is inconsistent with our law. Similarly, we respect and have to give effect to our international treaty obligations and conventions. And this we learned from global solidarity, the support the whole world gave us, and to us our tend to embrace those norms of global decency. Admirable rights jurisprudence has much to thank the Canadian jurisprudence. In our content analysis of fundamental rights when appropriate, we have sought guidance from the European Court of Human Rights. Added to this, our opinions or judgments draw readily, as I said, from international legal norms and standards. And in order to strike a balance between competing constitutional guarantees, we also look to the proportionality jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court. Returning to the Canadian love affair, our case law liaison, Chief Justice, the Canadian jurisprudence, has several substantive reasons. As with most domestic jurisdictions, our case law too is answerable only to our constitutional norms and the context in which they find application. Nothing inconsistent with our basic law may be grafted onto our case law. On the other hand, our basic law enjoins our courts and tribunals, as I've said already, to consider foreign law. And many of our courts have taken this injunction seriously and assumed this interpretive license. To that end, we have tended to look to Canadian rights jurisprudence. More readily than our erstwhile colonial masters, the United Kingdom, certainly not, certainly not the United States. The, re, the, the one reason is that the catalog of fundamental rights in our Bill of Rights, in part, echoes the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We had the opportunity to look when we made our own constitution and we looked at what you had written. Save for certain qualifications in Chapter 9 of the Charter, both texts bind Parliament and all organs of state. Both sets of fundamental rights and freedoms are justiciable. Courts may pronounce on them. In other words, perhaps the most binding influence of Canadian rights jurisprudence on us relates to the limitation of rights analysis and the cognate proportionality test. The limitation of the right clause in section one of the charter provides very similarly to South Africa's section 36 that rights and freedoms in the Charter are subject only to reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be reasonably demonstrated to be justified in a free, we have rather opted for open in the place of free, democratic society. Unlike our limitations rights provision, the Charter itself does not spell out factors to be taken into account when determining whether a limitation is reasonable and justified. The factors have been developed by case law since the adoption of the Charter. You'll remember quite well, Chief Justice, in 1936, Rex versus Oaks, your Supreme Court held that Section 1 of the Charter contemplated a two-stage process of judicial review of legislation. 
The first being whether an impugned law limits the right, and second, whether the limitation is reasonable, one that can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So too later in 1994, you'll remember quite well the justification criteria sets in Rex versus Oaks, which found its way into the limitation analysis. And ultimately into our first case, State versus Makunyani, which is death penalty case in South Africa. Thus, we too share with you the two-stage analysis on the limitation of entrenched rights premised on what is reasonable within an open or, if you like, free and democratic society. Both our rights limitation and justification analysis are rooted in proportionality. And it is interesting to note that the German Constitution does not have a general limitation clause in the sense of Section 36 of the Bill of Rights or Section 1 of the Canadian Charter. Many of the rights provided for contain internal limitations. We didn't stop there. Our borrowing from Canadian jurisprudence extended to a few other areas of our law. In State versus Zuma, not the one you know, another one who was charged for a hideous crime. One of the first cases of the new constitutional court was required to decide on the reverse owner's provision in the criminal procedure code which unjustifiably place a burden of proof on the maker of a confession, that is the accused person. And our new court didn't go too far, but looked at your jurisprudence and relied on Rex versus Big Drug Mart Limited by Dixon J, as he was then, and later your Chief Justice of Canada. The reasoning was fortified by Rex versus Oaks and again fortified by Rex versus White, and later by Rex versus Downey. And our court upheld, as your court did, that the reverse onus was inconsistent with free trial rights. We went on, as you do, to adopt purposive interpretation of constitutional provisions, and is now settled part of our law. And today, earlier, Chief Justice, was a debate between a justice from your court and a justice from the Supreme Court of the USA. It was a big debate about what, how the interpretation ought to be conducted. I had this one big smile that we had resolved this at the behest of Canadian jurisprudence long, long time ago. No originalism, no originalism purposive interpretation. And our court went down that route and ultimately also relied on Kindler versus Canada. Of course, nothing of what I've just said, if it has put any smiles on Canadians who are here present, means that our democratic enterprise is a replica of Canada's experience. There are marked differences deriving from our unique social and political context of the respective countries at the time of and leading up to the adoption of the Constitution. I've said this out with some detail to those scholars who want to look at those differences, and I'm not going to impose them on you right away. But the one thing I must say that we have adopted an unrelenting constitutional supremacy clause with strident repugnancy consequences, and therefore all law conduct which is inconsistent with the Constitution is invalid. And this again comes from the distaste, historical distaste, where apartheid and parliamentary sovereignty imposed a lot of positivistic harm on ourselves. And again, our constitution, unlike yours, does not have only vertical application, but also have horizontal applications. So we can hold to account anybody exercising power akin to the way a government does. But the third important difference with yours and our constitution is that we have written in socioeconomic rights into our basic law, and these are justiciable. Further difference, we have 11 official languages. You have only two. So we, and that was in the quest to demonstrate Nelson Mandela's desire for unity and diversity as mirrored even in the languages that we 
protect. And because of all this that he did, thus far our courts have been remarkable. As you have heard, we struck down capital punishment, right outright, as inconsistent with <coughs> fundamental human rights, and declared it cruel, inhuman, and degrading. We struck down scores of laws and executive action that undermined appropriate respect for diversity, or where they were under-inclusive, or where they harbored antiquated prejudices. I missed many rumblings, Courts would not tolerate, for example, homophobia in our country or gender inequality inspired by religious or cultural patriarchy. We have insisted that laws and policy must provide for adequate protection of children, root out domestic violence, people with disability, refugees as well as migrants. In a series of cases, we have given content the right to freedom of security of the persons. We have not hesitated to strike down legislation inconsistent with our supreme law and offending executive decisions on unlawful administrative decisions. This is not judicial overreach. Because the Constitution itself authorizes and compels our courts to declare unconstitutional laws or executive conduct that offends the Constitution. Our people, led by Nelson Mandela, have chosen to require the judiciary to police the frontiers of the Constitution. The wisdom of granting the judiciary wide constitutional review powers became ample in the last 10 years. We could not predict that Nelson Mandela was preparing us for the next bad leader we're likely to get. The Constitution shields the judiciary from undue executive and legislative interference. It is answerable to the law only that proved to be valuable protection to our people and its new democratic institutions. The focus of our jurisprudence shifted from rights enforcement to legislative and executive probity. The more recalcitrant the executive arm of our state became, and trust me, it became so over a whole decade, the greater the need was for judicial supervision despite repeated accusations of judicial overreach by the executive offenders. And luckily, the civilian populace of our country supported the judiciary to the hilt during these difficult times in our country. In some, at the worst of times, the judiciary held out to the constitutional promise inducted by Nelson Mandela. It is Nelson Mandela that I credit with that remarkable constitutional architecture and foresight that accrued to the benefit of the people of our country. I'm at the end, and this is the question I leave you with. Is Nelson Mandela still relevant? Old fossil to be forgotten or still relevant? What remains is to ask whether Nelson Mandela's world is still relevant to his country and to the broader global community. The answer may be self-evident. Every one of you is going to say, yes, of course it is relevant. And yet, I do not propose to answer the question today. I'm here to urge you to interrogate that very question. Let it suffice to draw attention to several dark clouds gathering. At home, and at Nelson Mandela's home, young people suggest that Nelson Mandela made compromises with the apartheid regime that rendered the transition to democracy less than useful. They use unkind words like Nelson Mandela sold out 
We can talk about that a little later. And I've been from campus to campus in law schools to debate the compromise, the transition, transitional justice, whether truth and reconciliation worked and whether we did the right thing historically. So for starters, in his very home, the prophet is being questioned and whether the transition was useful. They argue that the compromise failed to resolve poverty, social inequality, and landlessness. And I often say to them, you're collapsing many things into one. He created the opportunity for us to battle poverty, social inequality, and landlessness. And you can attribute that to him. Without a doubt, many leaders in his movement, in government, have not always covered themselves in glory. They have not always lived to the highest values that he has set for us as a people. And often, they've undermined his aspirations. And some of us have said so, so many times, in so many judgments, pointing this quite poignantly, and might I add, bravely. Other clouds are also gathering across the globe. We're battling with post-truth notions of relative and floating values. Nothing is self-evident anymore. And arguments are that there's no such thing as a self-evident truth. Narrow nationalism and jingoism, chauvinism if you like, in large and important countries are replacing global solidarity, compassion, and sharing. Patriotism is indeed welcome, but narrow, selfish self-interest threatens human solidarity, which underpin the finest notions of fundamental rights and freedoms of human rights across the world. Nation after nation is falling to right-leaning conservatism. Some even espouse white supremacist stances. Patriarchy is all in order. Women are fair game to abuse and to ridicule homophobia and other irrational obsessions. And this is what Nelson Mandela fought for all his life, to dislodge all these irrational obsessions. In consequence, we see often multilateral cooperation, which is hardly the norm anymore. Many feel free to break away from those decent those norms of decency that we have crafted and crystallized painstakingly through historic setbacks. War zones in developing countries still abound, and civilian victimhood and crimes against humanity are ever increasing. Social inequality and instability is causing migration and displacement, all of these posing a serious threat to our notion, our globalized notions of human right. And more so, human rights are violated in increasing countries. And I'm justified to therefore ask you, is Mandela and are human rights still relevant in our world? What do you say? 
Thank you for listening. Good night and God bless. It's my pleasure now to um, call on Bob Ray, a former Premier of Ontario, former Member of Parliament and interim leader of the Liberal Party, and if I may say so, as somebody who had the privilege to uh, be a Member of Parliament when he was there, uh, I have to say that Bob Ray was the best parliamentarian that I ever had the pleasure to witness. Bob. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for that very kind introduction, Erwin. Uh, uh, um, I, I can assure you that I'm not going to give a long response to uh, Associate Chief Justice Monoseki's wonderful and thoughtful speech. Um, but I do just want to say a couple of things uh, in thanks to him. Uh, many in the audience may not realize uh, the extent of uh, Justice Monoseki's personal courage uh, and clarity of vision, which uh, has not necessarily been shared by um, all, all others. And so much of what he has said has brought criticism uh, and has uh, made him a figure uh, of considerable importance, not only in South Africa, but globally, uh, because of the clarity of the vision that he has uh, and the importance that he attaches to the rule of law, not only uh, in his writings, uh, but in his decisions. Uh, and many of his decisions have uh, put him into considerable uh, conflict uh, with those who would uh, believe that uh, judges should know their place uh, and that that place is a rather limited one in the, uh, in the view of, uh, of some in positions of political power. But I think that uh, above all, what I take from uh, Mr. Justice Monoseki's wonderful uh, summary uh, of the life and the legacy of Nelson Mandela uh, is that history without Mandela would have been completely different. Uh, I think often we, we ascribe to impersonal forces and events um, the outcome of, of, of history. But I suspect that an audience like this at the University of Toronto uh, 30 or 40 years ago would never have anticipated that the transition to constitutional democracy would have taken place in South Africa. In fact, uh, uh, on our campus in the 1960s, there were, well, there were actually three assumptions, only one of which would make much sense to our guests, but the first one of which was that the wall in Berlin and the Iron Curtain between East and West would never come down. The second was that apartheid would continue indefinitely, and if it ever fell, it would fall as a result of terrible, bloody, revolutionary violence. And the third was that we would always have a conservative government in Ontario, which <laughs> I'm proud to say I had something to do with uh, bringing an end to at one time. Uh, for those of us who were lucky enough to meet uh, Nelson Mandela, it was impossible to meet with him. And I can tell you the one story that um, is, is, is a little different from the one I told Mr. Monoseki last night at dinner. I had the opportunity to know uh, Ted Scott very well. Archbishop Ted Scott was one of the three wise people, as they were called, uh, who were asked to intervene on behalf of a commonwealth and who uh, 
in the point at which the transition to freedom for Nelson Mandela was taking place uh, played a very critical role. And he knew of my personal interest in the subject, so he came to see me when I was not in government in opposition. And we were, he was explaining to me uh, the way in which he had been able to communicate with Nelson Mandela and um, how this was going to be such an important moment of transition for the world. And I said, with great respect, Your Grace, uh, how is it that you think that liberating or freeing one man who's been in jail for 27 years, how can that possibly have the kind of impact which you are, you are so confident is, is going to happen? And he looked at me and he said, listen to what I'm saying to you. When Nelson Mandela gets out of prison, he will come out without an ounce of rancor. He will come out without a smidgen of bitterness. And he will transform South Africa and he will change the world. I said, well, from your lips to God's ears, let it be, let it be so. And he was right. But I think what uh, Mr. Justice Moniseki has also told us is that this transition and the message that Nelson Mandela brought to the world is a transition that is not just about an abstract form of justice. It is about a very deep commitment to the rule of law. Uh, to a rule of law which constantly requires judgment and balance, which requires uh, an affirmation of principle, but a capacity to apply that principle with sensitivity and with great good judgment. As Canadians, you know, we, we have a, and it's true, we've had a very warm relationship with the anti-apartheid movement, and we've had a very warm relationship with the government of South Africa, and a very warm relationship between our, between our two courts. This is true. But as Canadians, let us not forget another unfortunate truth. And that is that it was Canada's Indian Act, which became the basis for Verfurt's apartheid legislation. And that the South Africans of that persuasion who came to Canada at that point, and for many years thereafter, never ceased to remind us of the fact that we had no business preaching to them because they had borrowed from us. And so we in Canada share this other great reality that we are both settler, indigenous countries. And whereas the number balance is quite different in our two countries, that reality is shared. And it poses a challenge for us as much as it still poses a challenge for South Africa. Mr. Justice, we are enormously in your debt for your address and for its thoughtfulness and for its depth. Let me assure you as somebody who speaks and lectures occasionally you had this audience, every word you were addressing, every word you were giving. No one, there was, there was never, there was never any, any, any risk at all that any of us would, would deviate from listening to what you had to say. In your description of his life, in your description of the significance of his contribution to transitional justice, and in your determination to raise the fundamental questions about where are we today faced with the forces who don't share the perspective, whether from the revolutionary left or the revolutionary right, who don't share that judgment and who don't share that perspective. Here we are one with you. Uh, but I think if I may dare to respond briefly to your question, it is to say there is no life and legacy more relevant to our country, to your country, 
and to the entire world than the life and legacy of Nelson Mandela. And for that, we are very grateful to you for reminding us of that. I just want to say that I think Bob Ray expressed our individual and collective understanding and appreciation as best one could. We sometimes say that the uh, world needs more Canada. I think that the world needs to remember and to act upon Nelson Mandela's great legacy for our collective humanity. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. <laughs>